Welcome to the audiobook Child of Woe, narrated by author Maury Blair. Chapter 1 The Animals Pray. The child was gaunt, half from poverty, half from nerves, hollow around the eyes, his triangular face drawn down into a grim, empty expression that did not even qualify as a frown. His hair, straight and dark and thin, was poorly cut and not very clean, and it ran all over his head at will. His skin, which should have been rosy pink at the age of seven, was a deathly yellowish gray. He would stand in a far corner of the bedroom, the dark corner, away from the door staring out the window onto the yard, and beyond to the bridge where the train tracks disappeared. He had perfected his technique night after night, of standing so motionless that he could attract no undue attention. There was no place to hide in the house but here, in the solemn darkness of the lonely bedroom. He could at least place four or five feet of distance between himself and the landing at the top of the stairs, but the fear was too much to face. The child would always face the window, his back to the door. The house was an old stucco, loose enough of construction that everyone in it could tell where everyone else was. The brothers and sisters could be playing and chatting and arguing on the lower level, with mother in the kitchen, and the solitary child upstairs could hear it all. When the danger was not so very present, he often slipped to the floor of the landing, lying flat on his skinny belly, with his chin resting on his knuckles, peering through the grating of the floor vent to the activity below. With the lights out upstairs, this vent and the bedroom window provided the only narrow shafts of light in the child's world. He gravitated to the light coming out of the floor as if it were a familiar friend, the kind one grows up with playing stickball within the streets, except the child had no such friend. And then the old loose house would tell its inhabitants that someone else has arrived. Invariably, the children downstairs would settle into an uneasy quiet as the old man lifted himself drunken up the steps of the cement porch, then lumbered to the screen door, which squealed when you opened it and hissed and slapped at you when you let it go behind you. So the old man was home again. He could be heard roaring and then grumbling and then roaring again, cursing profusely in the drunken stupor, growling as he stumbled around the lower level. The children and the mother made room for him, much as one willingly gets out of the way of a big, unfriendly animal. But none of these people were the animal's prey. Upstairs, the telltale slapping of the screen door sent a silent scream of alarm through the child. He jumped up in a single reflexive motion from his cozy place by the light on the floor and slipped through the bedroom door and far back into the corner to the window. He had learned to move quickly before the old man could hear him leaving the vent. He had learned not to hide under the covers. He had learned not to hide at all. It was useless, only standing straight and silent in the black corner of the room, looking motionless out the window, could he sometimes avoid the horror. And finally, after a minute, or an hour growling and snarling obscenities, the old man headed for the staircase. As each stair bent under his weight, the child suppressed a shiver. He tried not to tremble, because trembling could trigger the monster. The old man could take two routes. Each night it was a question of which he would choose. As he drew himself up the top step, he could either turn to his left toward the bathroom and his bedroom, or he could keep coming straight ahead through the door of the child's room. The child could always feel him mounting the top step. The boy waited in the shadows and prayed desperately, silently, that the old man would make the turn, make the turn, make the turn. Sometimes, if he had taken in too little liquor to exhaust himself, the old man could think clearly enough to sense the child's anguish. And then he relished that moment when he came to the landing at the top of the stairs. Relished making the child squirm inwardly while the decision was waiting to be made. To the frail and narrow child, he was a huge man. Although he was of no more than normal build, distinguished only by a bald head and a mustache, but his strong hands were punctuated by powerful and stout fingers. Standing on the landing, staring into the bedroom at the child's slender silhouette, the old man looked like a volcanic mountain longing to explode, but unconvinced of the value of expending the energy. And he stood cursing, all the time cursing on the landing. From the moment he began his long climb up the stairs, the ugly poison could be heard pouring forth all through the house. Depending on the extent of his drunkenness, he would rage like a bull or mutter like a threatened dog. But always as he approached the head of the stairs, his words were the same, fixed on the pale skinny child his face a splash of white by the window in the far corner. You black bastard, I'm going to kill you, you black bastard. The very words to the child's muscles tight, struck up by unrelieved panic. And then, when the worst 
would be realized that the old man would fail to make the turn and his drunken steps would carry him through the bedroom door and toward the terrified boy. You black bastard, I'm going to kill you. The child could feel the heat of his body as he approached. He could smell the liquor. He could almost taste the rage. The old man seized him by the upper arm, his great fingers wrapping around the child's limb as if it were a broom handle. With his other hand, he pushed the boy against the wall, then drew back his hand and closed his fingers into a colossal fist. For the rest of the family, it was an exercise in helplessness. The mother always tried in vain to stop the old man before he ever got to the steps. But he always managed to shout her down, or, more often, wait out the confrontation and slip around her to the stairway. Then as the children downstairs jumped in surprise to the sound of the child's body hitting the wall upstairs, the beleaguered mother bolted for the stairway. Downstairs, the children at the various ages had not all learned to ignore the horrible episodes. The older ones looked awkwardly at each other or at the floor. The younger ones looked wildly from face to face, seeking the relief of explanation, looking for someone to stop the shrieking from upstairs. The old man punched the child until he grew bored. Then he threw the boy on the floor like a rag doll and began kicking him. The child cried out until the cries choked in his throat. Then he just struggled to keep breathing. With the horror of the scene pressing in on him, the boy could still remember clearly not to resist more than he had to. Resisting, he always remembered, made the old man crazier. And finally, with the rage released, the old man came to rest still muttering about the black bastard. He turned and lurched around the corner into the bathroom where he would relieve himself of some of his liquor if he could stand up long enough. The child lay in a heap, gasping and crying quietly, his body pounding with pain, his mind spinning furiously with questions. Why does he hate me? Why is this happening to me? Why doesn't anyone want me? Long after the old man had trampled out of the bedroom and dumped himself on the bed, the child could risk picking himself up off the cold wooden floor. Sometimes one of his brothers would be there to help him up, to check over his bruises to make sure nothing was broken. And sometimes when the child failed to get up, the brothers would tap him and call his name. Maury, Maury, are you all right? It was strange in a way to hear that question in connection with my own name. There was nothing right about me. I was the despised black bastard, and I didn't know why.